Tonight, Israel's war against Hamas now expanding underground. A U.S. official telling NBC News the IDF is pumping seawater into the group's extensive tunnel network under Gaza. Above ground, Israel going door to door to fight Hamas and search for more than 100 hostages still being held captive in Gaza. But Israel's aggressive military campaign causing a humanitarian crisis that aid groups today called an apocalyptic freefall. And it's now sparking tension with Israel's biggest ally. Ally, the U.S. President Biden today saying Israel is starting to lose support around the world due to, quote, indiscriminate bombing, the swift response from Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. Meanwhile, Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky in Washington meeting with President Biden and making a plea to U.S. lawmakers to send more aid to Ukraine. Biden is pushing a $106 billion aid package for Ukraine, Israel, and U.S. border security. But Republicans say it does not do enough to fix a growing migrant crisis at home. The Kremlin closely watching today's visit will have a live report from Moscow. Moment of collapse, dramatic new footage showing part of a New York City apartment building giving way, sending dirt and debris crashing onto the ground below. Canines called in to search a 21-foot-high pile of debris. Luckily, no one was seriously hurt. But could have the collapse been prevented? The violation handed to the building just last month. Mowing down pedestrians, video from inside a car showing a driver intentionally hitting a woman as she crossed the street, then hitting a pedestrian in a bus lane, sending them onto the roof of the car. The urgent search for the person behind the wheel and the passenger who was telling them to hit people. Addicted to social media, a new study finding one third of U.S. teenagers are constantly on social media. The top sites they're using and how parents can help cut some screen time. And surviving the slope, skiers in Lake Tahoe dodging a massive bear that was charging across a mountain. What was waiting for the bear on the other side? Top story starts right now. And good evening. We begin tonight with Israel's expanding war against Hamas, not only pushing through Gaza, but also underneath it. Dramatic new video released by the IDF showing an Israeli soldier battling Hamas at an apartment in Gaza City. At one point, a grenade is launched at the soldier and detonates, but he manages to keep on fighting. But a new phase of this war may be beginning here inside Hamas's underground tunnels. I want to show you a map that was released by the IDF in 2021. It shows just how extensive and widespread the tunnel network is. You can see these yellow figurines that mark where those tunnels are. Uh, are underneath Gaza. Now, a U.S. official confirms to NBC News Israel is pumping seawater into a portion of the tunnels to flood them, but hostages are still believed to be inside. Israel today is saying they've recovered the bodies of these two hostages, an Israeli civilian and an IDF officer, deep in a tunnel near the home of a Hamas commander. Their coffins, you can see draped in Israeli flags, returned home. But for the first time in this war, the U.S. and Israel appear to be at odds. President Biden today saying, quote, you can't say no Palestinian state and adding that he thinks Israel is losing global support over the Gaza bombings. There's a lot to cover tonight, so let's get right to NBC's Richard Engel. Israel is pushing ahead with its devastating ground offensive in Gaza, fighting door to door to overthrow Hamas. And tonight, a U.S. official tells NBC News Israel is pumping seawater to flood Hamas tunnels in limited areas of Gaza saying it's unclear if it will work. There is assertions being made that there's quite sure there are no hostages in any of these tunnels. Israel's military campaign is now sparking tensions with the White House. President Biden speaking earlier at a fundraiser today, saying Israel is right to take on Hamas and has most of the world supporting them. But they're starting to lose that support by indiscriminate bombing in Gaza. And that Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's government has to change. You can't say there's no Palestinian state in the future. The administration wants the more moderate Palestinian Authority to take over post-war Gaza. But Netanyahu is rejecting that, saying overnight, I will not allow the entry into Gaza of those who educate for terrorism, support terrorism and finance terrorism. Today, six aid groups said the humanitarian situation in Gaza is in an apocalyptic freefall, writing the war has killed more than 7,500 children, more than all global conflicts last year combined. Israelis are still reeling from the October 7th attack when Hamas killed more than 1,200 people and took 240 hostages. 
Kibbutz Beri was overrun by Hamas at 6.30 a.m. Golan Abitvol, a data manager for a pharmaceutical company, was here as Hamas and other militants went house to house, killing and setting fires. And then were two terrorists just standing casually over there. No one is fighting them. Golan locked his family in a safe room in his house and went outside with his pistol. When you saw that they were focusing on your yeah. place and they were coming yeah. for you, that's when you emptied the magazine. Yeah, and uh, I, I hit them. They, they were hit. I don't know if I killed anyone. Luckily, the attackers moved on and didn't return. His security camera recorded when Israeli troops did finally come to the rescue 16 hours later. Does that slow response make you angry? People here angry? We were supposed to be protected, and we weren't. Richard joins us tonight from Jerusalem. Richard, let's pick up right where you left off there. Talk to us about that response time, because obviously the intelligence failure of October 7th is being investigated. But what about how long it took to get help to Israeli citizens who were suffering that day? So it's unclear where this investigation stands or if it is even taking place. Uh, the Israeli government has acknowledged that there was a massive failure both in failing to anticipate the attack, so it's not seeing the warning signs, even though Hamas was training that 3,000 fighters, maybe more according to the Israeli military, crossed the border. They didn't know that it was coming. Maybe signs were missed. But then the response time as well, that it took, in, the, in this case, 16 hours. Other places took eight hours. Uh, some places took overnight. We've spoken to people who were hiding by the side of the road um, and, and didn't see any troops coming for, for almost 24 hours. And the Israeli government has acknowledged that failure, too, and, and is providing a stock answer, saying that there will be an investigation thorough and complete, and that it will be done when the war is over. And some Israelis are accepting that, and they realize this is wartime. You can't have divisions. You can't um, take the time and focus away from, from the war fighting to look at the past. But, but many Israelis are increasingly frustrated with that standard answer, saying that uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu is refusing to accept responsibility. Richard Engel for us tonight again from Jerusalem. As the war between Israel and Hamas continues, 135 hostages remain in Gaza. Their family members desperate to bring them home safely. Tonight, I'm joined by Alana Zaitchek. She spoke with us, you may remember, a few weeks ago after the October 7th terror attack, sharing that six of her family members had been taken hostage. Tonight, five of them are now home, but one still remains in captivity. Alana, thanks so much for joining Top Story again. I know this is such a tough time for you and your family. How are your family members doing, the ones that were able to get out, and have you been able to communicate with them? I have, yes, I have FaceTimed with them and we text and they are easing their way in to life, but it's not very easy. There is a lot of pain and trauma that they're bringing with them, um, the children as well. Um, it's not life as usual. They can't just go back to normal. Um, and Sharon is without her, her husband, so she's experiencing a trauma compounded on top of trauma. You're talking about your cousin's husband, David, who is still being held by Hamas terrorists. Mm -hmm. How is she? What's, what's her mental space like right now? Her heart is very heavy. She's struggling. Um, he is her other half. And he's an amazing father to her children. And they were together um, in there. So. They, were, they were together when they were being held captive? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. they were. Um, David, her, and one of the twins were together. One of the other twins was separated from them and taken uh, separately for about 10 days before they finally returned that twin back to them. Let me get this right. The, the terrorists took away one of the twins yeah. from the family. Yeah, so they were separated. Like, th like, three of them were in one truck, three in the other. And once they were in Gaza, one of the twins was taken and was somewhere for 10 days. We don't know where. And how old are these, these little girls? Three years old. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Um, what, did, what else did she tell you? Were they held underground? Um, they were overground, um, and they were moved to various places. Um, the conditions were abysmal, in, 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 inhumane. Like, it's hard to comprehend. Um, a lot of people stuffed into a small windowless room. Um, food was an if. 
not when, you know, a bathroom, if they needed to go, had to knock and wait an hour, four hours, and children can't wait to go to the bathroom. Um, they had to try and entertain these kids, but also keep them quiet, keeping three-year-olds quiet all day long for 50 days. That is crazy. And then would they hear the bombing? Could they hear the bombing around them? Yes, they could. What was that like? Scary, terrifying. Um, in the tunnels as well, they can, they can hear the bombs. Um, and it's very scary. Was she able to say goodbye to David when she left? I mean, was, were they able to communicate before they were separated? Yeah, so they removed him from her three days prior to them being released. At first, she didn't know why. So all she knew is he was taken away. Um, so they did say their goodbye in some sort of, you know, when they kind of forcibly removed him from her, but she didn't know why. When, when you're seeing the images of, of the bombing of Gaza, now we're hearing they're gonna flood the tunnels with some seawater. Mm -hmm. uh, as somebody who still has a loved one over there, mm -hmm. what is going through your head? What's going through my head is that the hostage release needs to be the number one priority, that that's where all of the focus should be on is getting them out of there because it is the psychological torture that they are going through is something that people seem to overlook. And these people are, are in absolute hell every day and there isn't, like time is running out. So that should be the focus. You know, I'm, I'm curious because you had this terrible, horrific terrorist attack on October 7th and now we've had all these weeks of war and we're showing these images of Gaza and the images of Gaza are just terrible mm -hmm. and, and there have been lives lost, a lot of lives including children mm -hmm. on, on both sides. Uh, what do you want to see happen in, in this conflict? In the overall conflict? Yeah. I mean, right now I want to see all of the hostages released. I want to see innocent people saved. All innocent people deserve to be saved, to have a life. I want to see the end to suffering. I, I think that's what everyone should be asking for, to end this suffering. It's too much. Is your cousin upset with uh, the intelligence failure, with the response time from the soldiers, with being held there that long, with being separated from, from her husband? Is, does, she, does she have anger? I mean, what, what, are, what are her feelings? The feelings amongst, I think, them are helplessness. It is fear. It is agony. Um, and sure, I'm sure there's anger there, but it is desperation for this to be over and for the V to come home to be with them. Do you see when, when you see that, that Gaza is still being bombed all over and now being bombed in the south, and as we mentioned, they're thinking about flooding the tunnels. Do, mm -hmm. you, do you think there is still room to negotiate to get these other hostages back? I hope so, but we don't have any information. I don't have any information to inform me as to what negotiations are happening. So, Does the family, do, do, is somebody from the Israeli military or the government in contact with the family no. saying, this is where we're at on the negotiations, this is where we think what's happening to your husband, that kind of thing, are they in contact? I don't think they have that information. So they are in contact with the IDF, of course, and there is a hostage family forum in Israel that handles a lot of this for a lot of the families as well. How has that process been for them, the forum? Um, is it helpful? I think so, yeah. I mean, it's a lot of people. So they also manage the media for them, and, you know, there's a lot of that. But they have someone that contacts them from the army, um, but they don't really share information or intelligence of any sort. I know you, you and your family may be planning a trip to Israel in, in the coming months. What do you hope to do when you get over there? To hug them and kiss them and be with them. I FaceTimed with them, and I... I text with them, but I just, I want to just be with them and like see them in the flesh and, and they're my family and I love them and I just want to give them big kisses. Alana, I hope that by the time you get over there that, that something has happened and, may, and maybe there's a ceasefire, or maybe this, this war has even ended. It's what the world wants. Alana, thanks so much for joining us, SideCheck. We will be thinking about you and your family. Thank you. Yeah. Now to our other major headline tonight, Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky's high-stakes visit to Washington, meeting with President Biden in the Oval Office and pleading with Congress for more aid. It comes as Republican opposition mounts to more assistance for the war-torn country. NBC News senior White House correspondent Gabe Gutierrez has the latest. Tonight, with the war raging and a brutal winter fast approaching, Ukrainian President Zelensky is making an urgent plea to Congress and President Biden. In Ukraine, 
We are fighting for our country and freedom. The U.S. has already sent $111 billion in military and humanitarian aid to Ukraine since Russia's invasion began. But that money's running out. The Biden administration has been urging Congress to approve a new $106 billion package that includes roughly $60 billion for Ukraine, as well as support for Israel and money to strengthen the U.S.-Mexico border. Putin is banking on the United States failing to deliver for Ukraine. We must, we must, we must prove him wrong. Zelensky's hastily planned U.S. trip is a dramatic difference from his first wartime visit last year, where he arrived to a hero's welcome. Today, Zelensky met with lawmakers behind closed doors. Skeptical Republicans want to overhaul immigration policies at the U.S. southern border before they sign off on any new money for Ukraine. Our first condition on any national security supplemental spending package is about our own national security first. The border is an absolute catastrophe, and this is because of the policies of this White House and this administration. The House Speaker also saying he wants an accounting of U.S. money already sent to Ukraine and that Zelensky has not provided a clear strategy to win. The war has largely become a stalemate. In recent months, Ukraine taking back no major Russian-held territory as its latest counteroffensive mostly fizzled. But the White House in newly declassified intelligence says the Russian military has suffered more than 13,000 casualties since October. Meanwhile, Zelensky with a sharp rebuke for some Republicans calling for peace talks and suggesting Ukraine give up territory. That's insane, to be honest. I have a question to these people, if they are ready to give up their children to terrorists. I think no. Gabe Gutierrez joins us tonight from the White House. Gabe, you mentioned President Zelensky's closed-door meetings with lawmakers. Are we hearing anything about progress in those talks? Well, not at this point, Tom. President Zelensky emphatically made that point, especially to Republicans, of the necessity for this aid, trying to argue that it is essential for U.S. national security. Now, one interesting point, Tom, publicly, President Zelensky has been very reluctant to weigh in on the immigration debate, saying that it is a domestic issue and he doesn't want to weigh in on it. But we did hear from at least one senator today, Dick Durbin from Illinois, said that President Zelensky tried to make the case to skeptical Republicans that if Putin is allowed to go unchecked into Ukraine, there could be increased migration, a bigger refugee crisis for the Ukraine. So that's another reason the U.S. should be very interested in what happens in his country, Tom. And then, Gabe, is there a timeline or, or are we just not even close to even figuring out there could be a potential deal? At this point, things seem very far apart, Tom. It is increasingly unlikely that a deal will get done before the end of this week, before lawmakers head home for the holidays. So these talks could likely go on into January, and that is something that the White House says could critically hamper the war effort, Tom. All right, Gabe Gutierrez, great to have you back at the White House. As Zelensky appeals for more aid from the U.S. government, Kremlin officials saying today they are closely watching the Ukrainian president's visit to Washington. It comes as Russian forces have ramped up attacks on Ukraine's capital, hitting Kyiv with a barrage of cruise missiles. I want to get right to NBC News' chief international correspondent, who joins Top Story tonight, live from Moscow, Russia. Kier, thanks for joining us here. I, I, you know, I was watching Gabe's report, right, and he points out how last year Zelensky came to Capitol Hill, he got a standing ovation, and now he's fighting to get money. And I can't think... I can't, I can't help but think that, that Vladimir Putin is watching this news from the Kremlin and just smiling. I think you're right about that, Tom, honestly. I mean, it's uh, coming up to, uh, it's well, well after 3 a.m. here in Moscow, so uh, clearly uh, in the Kremlin there won't be many people awake, but I suspect they may well have been, some of them at least, awake to watch that news conference with uh, President Biden and President uh, Zelensky. And I, frankly, I, I don't think uh, you need to be a genius to figure out that the Russians would dearly love to see <clears throat> the Congress and not provide this extra money for Ukraine. <clears throat> Excuse me. And uh, the Kremlin uh, spokesman, Dmitry Peskov, uh, saying today that they are watching closely what's happening there in Washington and suggesting, saying that why would America spend tens of billions of dollars more on uh, the war in Ukraine 
Uh, he says that that is not going to move the needle in terms of the battlefield. So, Tom, uh, the Russians from here in Moscow trying to make uh, arguments for why it should not happen. The fundamental question, though, the fundamental issue is that there is uh, no uh, sign that either side, Ukraine or Russia, is prepared to give up territory. And, of course, you would need something like that, some kind of agreement on territory in order for there to be talks and some kind of a re resolution that goes beyond the actual fighting. Kira, let's get to our new reporting. Gabe also mentioned a bit of it in his report, the newly declassified intelligence that's been shared with Congress, showing Russia has suffered, you know, massive losses. Look at this on the battlefield. An estimated 315,000 Russian soldiers have been killed since February of 2022. That's more than 87 percent of its forces at the start of this invasion. Is that something that is being discussed at all where you are? I know it's state run media, but I, but that is a lot of Russians to have died in this war. And it's not being discussed, not the, that, that kind of thing. And, and the Russian government will describe that as disinformation. They'll, they'll, they'll if not deny it, they'll, they'll simply say that, it's, that it's, it's lies, frankly, they will say, coming from the, the U.S. Now, uh, I mean, I think an important part of this, uh, Tom, honestly, though, is that, you know, <laughs> looking at this in terms of just how things have gone on the, on the battlefield and in terms of what President Putin calls his special military operation, as far as uh, Russia is concerned, it, it has been able to continue uh, the Russian families have continued to send loved ones uh, to uh, the front. And, and you, here in, in Moscow, uh, on the economy, you, Tom, you have a sense that things are frankly fine, and that's what the uh, numbers suggest. Uh, and some of that is because so much money has been invested in the, the war effort, if you like, in, in, in factories producing uh, armaments and, uh, and munitions. That's helped the, the Russian economy. So too has the ability, uh, continuing ability to sell uh, uh, gas uh, and oil uh, and sanctions have simply not had the impact uh, that the West had hoped they would have. Listen, Russia has been isolated in, in many profound ways. To just to get here, Tom, it's not possible to fly direct from Europe. You have to fly around just to get here to Moscow. So there have been profound changes as a result of what's happened. But the truth is that Russia has still been able to trade with China, uh, with India, uh, and that, and with some of those countries in the, in the Gulf states, uh, and that has kept the Russian economy afloat, and President Putin believes he can keep going. Quite literally fueling the war. All right, Keir Simmons for us. Keir, please stay safe where you are tonight. Back here at home, we want to get to the latest on that terrifying building collapse we brought you last night in New York City. New video showing the moment it came down with little warning. We're also learning the building had active violations and was issued a summons over concerns just last month. Valerie Castro tonight on the scene for us. Tonight, shocking new surveillance footage showing the moment a Bronx apartment building partially collapses. Another angle showing people run for safety as debris and dust cascades onto the ground below. I heard like a big boom. One neighbor, Shakira Almonte, recalling the horrifying moment she witnessed through her apartment window. When I look outside, I just see people running. Canines called in to search the rubble for anyone who may have been trapped. But the FDNY saying miraculously no one was severely injured and that as of last night it had gone through a large pile of debris up to 12 feet high in spots and had found no victims. Now investigators are focused on how this happened and if there were missed warning signs. Department of Building documents obtained by NBC News shows the building had open violations. A summons issued by city inspectors just last month raising concerns about what they called deteriorated and broken mud sills, the platforms that sit under scaffolding columns and distribute weight. The inspector writing that there was, quote, one vertical member with missing mud sill, which can compromise the structural stability, causing a potential collapse. It is not clear if the inspector was talking about a potential collapse of the scaffolding or or the building itself. In a press conference, Department of Building officials saying there were also facade issues flagged in a report submitted by the building's owner in March of 2021. That report did find unsafe facade conditions, seven of them, uh, mortar that was deteriorating, cracked bricks. The commissioner saying investigators will look more into the cause once the site is cleared for safety by first responders. But tonight, residents are still reeling from the shock. The ground was shaking. It was just like it was an earthquake. Angel Soto inside with his mother as part of that building started to come down. We opened the door and the super's like, no, the building's collapsed. You've got to get out. The New York City Emergency Management Department telling NBC News they are helping more than 100 displaced residents. It's devastating. Uh, I feel for the family. Prayers out to them and hopefully... There's, you know, issues that, I mean, 
the, the issues are resolved and hopefully our city does a good job of making sure that everything goes well with them. Dozens of families left without a home over the holidays. Valerie Castro joins us from the scene tonight. Valerie, I kind of want to go back to that video that captured the moments the collapse happened. Do we know how much time people had essentially to get out of the way before that side of the building came, to, came crashing down? Yeah, well, Tom, if you take a look at the video, it looks like people just had seconds to get out of the way. The bottom level of this building has several businesses, including a convenience store. People there tell NBC New York that they actually heard a loud noise right before the building collapsed. A pipe burst, and then they saw some water trickling out. That was their indication that something was wrong, and they say that is when they ran outside with just seconds to spare. Tom. And then do we know what the next steps are here for the city and, and for whomever owned that building? Right, so the Department of Buildings has been here throughout the day with a team of forensic engineers. They say they are here to monitor what will be the emergency demolition of that corner of the building that collapsed. They spent the day putting up a sort of plywood structure or plywood wall around the intersection so they can safely do that. But, of course, their investigation into why and how this all happened is still continuing. Tom. Valerie Castro for us from the Bronx tonight. Valerie, thank you. Still ahead, mowing down pedestrians. Video from inside a car captures a driver hitting two pedestrians while other passengers encourage them to do so and laugh. The urgent search for those suspects. Plus, a man in Los Angeles under arrest after he arrived on a flight in Denmark with no passport or plane ticket. What flight, flight attendants saw that led them to believe he snuck onto the flight. And skiers in Lake Tahoe met with a charging bear on the slopes. What those skiers say was on the other side of the mountain that caused the terrifying scene. We'll explain. Stay with us. We're back now with a disturbing pair of hit and runs in Seattle, just blocks apart. Police tonight still searching for the suspects who recorded the moments they mowed down pedestrians with their car. Those incidents chillingly similar to a fatal hit and run in Las Vegas earlier this year. Maura Barrett has the details. Tonight, Seattle police searching for suspects in a pair of violent hit and runs recorded from inside the attacker's car. In the first, someone inside the vehicle tells the driver to hit a woman crossing the street. As the car strikes the woman, the people inside the car are heard laughing. Police say this surveillance video shows that same incident. In a second run in, just a few blocks away from the first, the driver directly plows into another pedestrian walking in the bus lane, striking the victim from behind, sending them toppling over the roof of the vehicle. In each video, the driver targets and strikes random pedestrians. Tonight, I'm asking for anyone with information to please come forward. In a statement, the Seattle police writing that the suspect vehicle did not stop in either incident. Based on the speed of the impact, it's likely that the victim suffered serious injury. The department declined to clarify how they obtained the cell phone videos. It is so horribly unfortunate that you have uh, individuals in any community who would take such egregious tactics to hurt others and then somehow feel that it's comical. As far as the community is concerned, stay vigilant as you walk in and around your communities. The videos from Seattle, disturbing and remarkably similar to a case that dominated headlines in Las Vegas this summer. Two teens accused of killing a retired police chief in a hit and run using a stolen vehicle. Authorities say this video shows the moment Andy Probst was intentionally run down as he rode his bicycle. In body cam video taken after the driver's arrest, one of the suspects focused on the media attention he would get. Do you think I'm gonna come out on the news? You might. It won't be for anything good. It won't make your mama proud. Both Jesus Ayala and Jasmine Keys, who are being charged as adults, have pled not guilty to murder and numerous felony accounts. The pair seen laughing and smiling in court, enraging the victim's family. They were flipping us off. How are you, can you sit there after taking a man's life? Those videos just angering to watch. And I should note, in those cases in Seattle, police are not only asking for help in identifying the suspects, but also in identifying the victims. This happened in late November, and police say that detectives have reviewed 911 calls to check on police ports, uh, gone over hospital admissions, and even surveyed the area talking to witnesses for any clues, but they still haven't located the victims. Tom? Hopefully they catch him soon. Okay, Maura, thank you for that. When we come back, another shocking dash cam video. This one from Miami. A driver leading police in a high-speed chase, except he was in an Amazon delivery van where he allegedly stole the van from and how this all came to an end.
right, we're back now with Top Stories News Feed. Harvard's president is set to keep her job for now, despite backlash from a congressional hearing on anti-Semitism. The Harvard Corporation announcing that Claudine Gay will stay in office. There had been pressure for the university's board to fire her after she dodged a question on whether calls for genocide were against Harvard's code of conduct. More than 700 of her faculty members signed a letter supporting Gay. A Russian stowaway discovered on a flight from Denmark to L.A. last month a criminal complaint shows the man arrived at LAX, but when he reached customs, officers discovered he was not listed as a passenger on the flight. And get this, didn't even have a passport. He did have Russian and Israeli IDs, according to the complaint. The flight crew noticed the man walking around the plane didn't appear to have an assigned seat and kept asking for meals. It's unclear how he got on the flight. A driver in a stolen Amazon delivery van leading police on a high-speed chase through Miami. Dash cam video shows the van driving on the shoulder of I-95, weaving in and out of traffic and even going over dividers. Police eventually pulling the driver over using a pit maneuver. He took off on foot, but police arrested him. Officials say he stole the truck from a car dealership while it was delivering parts. And dramatic video shows the moment a bear made a mad dash across a ski slope in Lake Tahoe. Check this out. New video shows the bear charging right by skiers at a resort. One skier managing to swerve out of the bear's path just in time. According to the person who filmed the video, the bear was trying to join its mother on the other side of the mountain. Luckily, no one was hurt. Okay, we're going to turn now to a rare look inside an arms race in space. The U.S. ramping up the development of space technology amid concerns China may be expanding its arsenal at a much faster rate. Our Courtney Cuby visits a rocket factory in Alabama to see firsthand U.S. efforts to compete with China militarily. Growing tensions between the U.S. and China now extending to hundreds of miles above the Earth. We know when we're threatened. We need to be able to counter the threat. To get an inside look at some of the latest American technology to counter the Chinese threat, we went to United Launch Alliance's factory in Alabama, working on defenses against things like Chinese satellites that can use robotic arms to drag other satellites out of orbit, meaning China could disable critical American communication satellites. They were actually able to grapple, grab a hold of one of their defunct GPS or beta satellites. What is the concern about them having that kind of capability in space? Anything that can interact with the spacecraft for servicing is inherently capable of interacting with the spacecraft to harm it or to gather intelligence from it. And fears tonight that China is moving faster than the U.S. in this new space race, including not just in space, but the skies just above us, not only using satellites, but spy balloons and hypersonic missiles. When you look at the threat from China in space right now, what concerns you the most? We seem to be asleep at the switch. Dean Chang is an expert on China's space program, which has more than doubled in the past five years. Do you think that China is, militarily is ahead of the U.S. in space? I think the Chinese one are giving us a real good run for the money. He says another potential Chinese threat to the U.S. from space includes a cyber attack that allows China to remotely take control of an American satellite. You could say to the satellite, deorbit come crashing down and there goes a billion dollar payload crashing into the Pacific. Or disrupt American missile defense systems. The really scary one, of course, is if you could spoof missile early warning systems so that they don't report a missile launch, that's the ultimate night. U.S. officials tell NBC News China can already do both. And China successfully launched its own refueler a few weeks ago, which enables China to keep its satellites in orbit longer. In the meantime, the U.S. may still be months away from the same technology. And multiple U.S. military officials tell us perhaps most concerning, China launched a hypersonic missile capable of orbiting the globe over and over, then suddenly dropping to Earth before most missile defense systems can respond. We continue to look at that very closely, but that's a capability they just recently demonstrated. A possible defense, lasers. You can't outmaneuver a speed of light laser. Courtney Kuby joins us tonight from the Pentagon. Courtney, when we talk about lasers, like we just heard in your report there, we obviously have ideas that Hollywood has shown us, but how, how would these actually work? Yeah, I mean, when you think about a space laser, you immediately start thinking about some cool sci-fi um, movie with an amazing villain and, a, and an amazing uh, you know, hero in it. 
But the reality is some U.S. adversaries, including China, have actually already fielded, meaning they are using space lasers right now, today. In fact, in one case, at least one case, we know that China has used a space laser to disable the satellite, the sensor on a U.S. satellite. Essentially, it flames it out or it overwhelms it with this laser. And if they have that capability, they've already shown it, the reality is they might be able to use it in other ways that could potentially put the U.S. in harm, Tom. And that leads me to my next question, right, because we heard in your report there all the Chinese space technologies that we know about. But I have to imagine there are devices that we do not uh, know anything about, which makes things a little bit more alarming. And re the reality is the U.S. probably knows a lot more about this than they're even sharing with us. But the Chinese military is not very transparent about its capabilities, and its space forces and cyber forces are two of the least transparent of its capabilities. So, yes, that is a very real concern. What we learned, though, in the, the course of reporting on this story is the U.S., whether it's U.S. civilian industry or U.S. military, is trying to prepare for a lot of eventualities that we know about and even some that we aren't even aware of, Tom. Courtney QB for us tonight. Courtney, we thank you for that. Now to Top Stories Global Watch and the worsening hunger crisis in Africa. The U.N. says a record 50 million people are expected to go hungry in West and Central Africa next year. The number is 4% higher than it was in 2023. Conflicts, climate change, and skyrocketing food prices all fueling this crisis. In places like Burkina Faso and Mali, the average price for a day's worth of food is 110% higher than the daily minimum wage. The president of one of Turkey's top soccer clubs arrested for attacking a referee during a match. Photos show the ref on the ground after the soccer club president punched him in the face following the game's final whistle. The ref also kicked when fans stormed the field. He was hospitalized with a fractured eye. Turkey's football federation suspending all league games indefinitely while they address the violence. And Spain seizing 11 tons of cocaine in what authorities called a major blow to one of Europe's most powerful drug trafficking networks. New drone footage shows the hundreds of seized drug packages. Look at that. Authorities say more than seven tons were found inside frozen tuna fish containers in the port of Vigo. The rest was found during a bust in Valencia. Authorities say the drugs come from South America with the intent to distribute all across Europe. At least 20 people so far have been arrested. Okay, coming up, the new and alarming numbers about teens and social media use. One-third of teenagers saying they are almost constantly glued to their devices. What sites they're looking at and the dangers. That's next. We're back now with an alarming new study about teens and their social media use. Pew Research Center finding that one-third of U.S. teenagers say they almost constantly are using one of the top five social media sites, with 93% of users aged 13 to 17 using YouTube, 63% using TikTok, 60% on Snapchat, 59% on Instagram, and 33% using Facebook. To break down what this means for our kids, I want to bring in Dr. Jennifer Harstein. She's a child and family psychologist. Dr. Jen, thanks so much for joining Top Story tonight. So, so. Far and away, YouTube is the most popular, and, and kids are watching videos, they're watching short clips. What's the danger with YouTube, do you think? Well, I think the danger with any screen time is that we're just using it indiscriminately. The fact that they're on almost constantly means they're not doing meaningful interaction with their screens. They're just mindlessly watching things. And we know that one video leads to the next, leads to the next. So do they even know how much time they're really on? Like, I don't know about that. You know, kids and, and parents were, were always having open conversations, at least growing up, about what was on television, uh, what you were putting in your bodies, whether it be candy or, or junk food. Are those conversations? conversations happening with parents and children when it comes to social media because I feel like there's there's so many traps when it comes to social media. One of the best lines I saw in an article I was reading was saying that we are over protecting our kids in real life and under protecting them online. So I do not think we are paying as much attention to what they're doing because oftentimes they're doing it in their rooms behind closed doors. We think they're doing homework. They're on YouTube. They're watching videos and they're just, you know, we know the dopamine hit keeps it coming. So they're staying on and they're staying on and they're staying on. The other day I was outside uh, shooting some hoops with with a fellow dad and, and our kids we were just having a good time. And I was saying, you know, after school growing up, this is all we had. I mean, we had a basketball hoop or we'd play outside on our bikes. 
And nowadays, I, I feel like kids are doing that less and less, mm -hmm. at, at least what I'm seeing in my, in, in my experiences, because of the screen time. Are, are we seeing kids just not experiencing what little kids should be experiencing, whether it be playing sports or just playing outside or going to a neighbor's house because they now have these devices? I think we're seeing it for two reasons. I think one is we're seeing it because they're on their devices and parents don't always know the best way to limit that. And then I see the other thing is we're afraid to let the kids have the freedom. I grew up with the freedom. You grew up with the freedom. Parents are afraid to have that in their space because they can't control it. So they aren't encouraging their kids to be independent and we're doing them a disservice because we're actually raising more anxious kids. I want to put another stat up on the screen for our viewers here. Uh, the amount of teens who say they are almost constantly using social media nearly doubled since the first time Pew conducted this research in 2015. That's an exponential increase. Is, is this something you're seeing with, with the patients that you're talking to and the families you're talking to? 100%. I think the fact is we're giving kids a computer in their pocket and not teaching them what it means to have that, right? We would monitor if they're sitting in front of us, but they're walking to school. They're, they're kind of walking with their heads down all the time. So we need to be talking about how are you using it meaningfully, not how are you limiting the time? Because then when they use it meaningfully, they aren't on for as long. And we need to encourage them to get out, be independent, be with other people, have in real life interactions. So there seems to be a trend, right? When we put back up on the screen what kids are using, you see that sort of Twitter and Facebook have, have <laughs> fallen a little bit off the map. They're not as popular at all anymore. No. TikTok, Snapchat, and obviously YouTube still very popular. Is, is this sort of a trend line that, that we should be aware of? Because do these apps, or I should say these social media apps, do they, they fall out of favor and then something else will be created? Yeah, when, when my age people start to use them more extensively, kids go, we're done with that. So YouTube may be the only one that that might not be the same case yeah. for. But I think that as like their parents and their older generations get on those apps, they move on to the next one. So it's really what's the next big one. And I think, you know, like Be Real is something that's coming up in their usage, all of these different things. So it's going to always be what's the next and we have to stay on top of it. So if you have a, a household with multiple children, there are times on the weekends when everything's silent. Mm -hmm. It's kind of nice for the parents. It's because every one's on a tablet. Uh, but obviously, as we've talked about, there's a danger there. What, what should parents be aware of and, and what's the advice you give to them? So I think I, what I say to parents is, look, like know what your kids are looking at. Remember that, that having a phone or a tablet or a computer is a privilege, not a right. So it's still yours. And so talk to your kids about what they need to be doing with that, how they are using it, and find time where nobody's on devices, where you as a parent are modeling what it's like to be having a conversation and not on your own device and have like family time with device three. So you teach them what it's like to be without their devices. They can survive it. What's the age you say is appropriate for some of these, these apps, like whether it be TikTok or Instagram? You know, we, we have kids on them so much younger. It's supposed to be 13. I think that 13 is a really reasonable like cutoff. But the fact is, is that even that's young for some of them to process the information that's coming at them. So if you give them access, be monitoring it. Let them know they have to be friends with you. Check what they're looking at talk to them about what they're looking at so that you can help navigate all of the information that they're being bombarded with. All right, Dr. Jen, thanks so much for that advice. Great, great talking to you tonight. I'm Tom Yamas in New York. Stay right there. More news on the way. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.